There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wendy, um, and welcome to the library's very first Code and Coffee pop-up event. I'm so happy that you all can make it tonight. Um, tonight, we have three amazing speakers. We have Luis over here. He'll be talking about a one-page business plan, right? Um, we also have Andrew over here. He'll be talking about um, user experience. And we'll have Anna over here talking about um, sensing tweets. And um, so a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, washrooms are up the stairs on the second floor, uh, down the hall and to your right. And also, there are a couple of handouts on your seats tonight. One is about a Lunch and Learn Maker event um, that's happening over here. Um, we really would like you to join us if you can. So if you're, ever inter if you're interested, um, please visit our website and you can register on our events calendar. And the second thing is a digital program evaluation form. We just want to know kind of where you're from and what your interests are and how you heard about this program. So you don't mind taking a minute to fill this out at some point. Um, please do, it would help us a lot. And finally, um, coffee in the back, uh, help yourself. And so, oh, one last thing. Uh, we are recording this event tonight and live streaming it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> FYI, um, if you have any concerns, please um, come talk to me about it. And oh yeah, and thank you also, I guess I have to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, coffee is provided by Sauce Labs tonight. I think that covers everything. Is there anything else? Okay, uh, without further ado, please welcome Luis. Am I on now? Am I on now? Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, good. Nice. So, hello everyone. Welcome for coming. And uh, we're gonna talk about gonna talk about we're gonna talk about one page business plan but in a kind of different way let's let's make it a Batman and the Joker funny way because it will stick more so this is an idea a quick idea to get you from from an idea to a plan and it's instead of what you think is like oh this is gonna be my million dollar idea sometimes it's gonna it, it is because we need to evolve our ideas. We need to either evolve our small idea or we need to kill the idea, actually. And it's better to kill a lot of ideas and get the good ones that stick around, like throw a lot into the, into the wall and let's see what, does, what, what it sticks. So that's the reason you're quickly gonna do it in a one page. Um, we're gonna see it in the market and the business, explained by these guys. Um, a little bit about me, who is Luis. These are my handlers. Uh, what handsome guy. <laughs> this, these are my handlers. I'm from ba originally from Honduras, so my English is it's, it's not that good. <laughs> but my English, I'm an industrial engineer by profession, transitioning a little bit to product management. And uh, I love to design and code for, uh, for a bit. These are my hobbies. I actually run a tech community in Surrey called Surrey Code Camp. If you know somebody, let them know about Surrey Code Camp. We meet bi-weekly over there. And I also have my media company called Typo Media, which is, um, I try to get websites to be friendly to humans, actually. That's my goal to, uh, with this Typo Media. So let's start. What are the benefits of doing a one-page business plan? It is a great exercise. They, if you get it, you will do it quickly. And for every idea that you have, it will help you cover problems like that with your idea. It can evolve your idea quickly, and it will help you gain momentum, which is the, the, this is like the major one. It will help you gain momentum because once you've found something that it doesn't cover problems, it can evolve your idea, it will get you momentum. It gets you ready for investors is, if it's good, possible hires and how to explain it to my mother-in-law, which I do often. 
So this is a basic structure and it fits in one page completely. Mission, target market, pain solution, the team. We'll see all of them in the, in the next slides. So the market, let's start. So let's start about, let's talk about the target market. Once, once you find a target market, let's see somebody who has a problem, they complain about, uh, they complain about it often or they get around it often that they don't even notice. Like, they don't even notice completely, but you notice they have a problem. So you uncover the pain points, which is called what they are suffering about, what, they, uh, what everybody's suffering about. Most uh, of the companies does it, and they focus in one thing only, that painful problem with the audience that they're going to do. It's like the joker. And you get a solution for them. You simply explain how to kill the Batman. So you get a solution for them, and that's, that's finding you, are, you are already have your market, target market, your solution to it. So you start with the, with, the, with the business. Let's call it that way. Let's start with your mission. The mission, it's short. It has to, this is the best way of explaining it. It has to fit in a tweet, 140 characters or less. Like it's, it's, it has to be short, so short that fits in a tweet, yet it can move masses. And I have some examples for you. Like, you know this, guys. This is the mission for them. It has, well, it's left pending 58 characters. I actually put it on Twitter so I could, I could fit it up. Mobify, this is, the, um, this, uh, this is Amazon. 28 characters, pretty good. 28 characters pending. And yet sometimes we have the guys that goes over 140 characters. I'm not that not that happy about it. So your business model, you can stop reading that. It's just text. I don't normally do text. And the business model it has to be like pretty quick. Five, five steps. There's five steps that has to be there. Like it has to happen. And I will explain this to you later. When don't get too attached to the business model, it will evolve. Right now you have an idea. You're just putting it on paper. Don't get too attached to it. Don't try to overthink it too much. Just put it there. Like one step, we find it. Two step, we tackle it. Three step, we do this. Four step, we monetize. And the five step, we grow. That's basically it. The business model. Oh, by the way, did you know that Batman usually used to use guns when it started? Like the, the actual comic used guns. Batman used guns. And then it evolved. Like... The Batman that we know now, he did never used guns for it, for anything, an exception of the last movie, but that's an exception. So anybody knows what this business model is? This is Groupon. This is their original business model done in a napkin, a literal napkin. It has one, two, three steps. This is the original, like that fast has to happen, like in, a, in an afternoon, oh, I have this great idea and I'm going to put it on and I'm going to build the next big thing. Let's put it in a, uh, let's hold on. Let's put it in a paper. Three, five steps maximum. Then to those five steps, sometimes we have not the skills that we need. And then we start thinking about how, how am I going to structure a team? Like, do I need a co-founder? Do I need a a person who helped me out on, on UX, we will get UX later today. The, just, it doesn't have to be like the person in your head at the top of your head and put it there. It just have to be, oh, somebody, I'm, I'm, for example, myself, I know, I know coding enough to get an HTML CSS up and running, but I don't know any backend whatsoever, so I would definitely go for a backend guy. And then the financial summary is put solid numbers, like how much do I think I need, and put 
how much do I, do I get? Remember, and don't get too attached to it also. It's just a one page again, because you are here right now. Like, this is the actual milestones that normally a startup gets into. Like, found the company with your idea model. That will help you out to either kill it or evolve it. You found the company, you get some money, and then you go to launch to the, to the steps of launching something. And then you open your mouth and ask. Like, go and tell everybody that you know if it's a good fit. Like, uh, and you tell them and they will give you feedback or they will tell you, talk to that guy, talk to that guy. You never know who are you talking to. So definitely do it. I will encourage you to do it once you have it. And oh, if you're good at something, never do it for free. That's something that I do remember from this movie. So once we already saw mission, target marker, pain, solution, the team, and all of them. So there are some things not to do. It's not cool. Let the plan be too long. Remember, this is just going to waste your time to, be, to do a long, big plan as we were taught, like young. I was thought of doing at least 30 pages of a business plan. I don't do it. I have never done it, by the way. Do not use uh, software. If, if there's somebody from software from business plan, I'm sorry, but do not use it. They will structure too much corporate things that you don't actually need. Um, do it for more than one page? No. <laughs> Don't do it for more than one page. It has to fit, and it goes from there. Some things that you can do to go in the fast lane. Um, practice, practice with it everywhere. Every idea that you have, even if, it, if, even if you know it's going to be the next big thing, practice with it. If it's not going to be the next thing, practice too. You will find it. Like do a sandbox of ideas, that's what I tell everybody. Do a sandbox of ideas and you will pick the best one. Eventually one of them will get you in traction. And share it, completely share it. Don't be afraid, people will not, will not steal your idea. And if, even if it's a big idea, it's too big for the people. And they will encourage you, they will, they will tell you how to go but share it, definitely share it. Oh, and that's it. Oh, hold on. Some resources. Start by the video. I'm going to share this, this presentation with whoever wants it, to be honest. Start by, the, by this video, definitely. You can, uh, uh, this book, I highly recommend everybody to read this book. This is actually less, like it costs way less than a, than a cup of coffee, a Starbucks coffee, and it's really good. It's an ebook. it's on Amazon. And uh, if you use Snapchat, I follow these two guys. They share a lot of information. There are actually, there are actually investors. They share a lot of information through their Snapchat. And that will be all. Thank you. Have any questions? Yeah. Is that fundraising field going to talk about grants to nonprofits as well? Is it just for. Uh, it mostly talks, uh, right, grants and not for profits, it doesn't touch too much in depth for that. It mostly talks about uh, funding, about getting funding for private companies and from, from private investors. Yeah. But it gives you a lot of, of resources and actually um, it's a. Uh, Basically, works the same way. So basically, works the same way. You're asking for funding from the from the government. That you're asking for funding for. They're actually harder to get, but basically, boss. Like it. It's a really good start book to read. Yeah. Anyone else? Or I will give my talk to the next person. Perfect. Thank you very much.
Okay, so we're ready for the next presentation. Um, this one is from Andrew, and he's going to be talking about the best experience is no experience. Testing. Testing. There you go. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Andrew. I am an end-to-end -end designer that takes ideas to market execution. Uh, my primary, primary ex expertise is on UX and UI and product design. Little thing about me, um, I like to eat pizza, love to play board games, watch movies, <laughs> and also video games. And also, another one of my greatest passion is martial arts. Uh, now, show of hands, who knows who this guy is? And what's his name? Kato? <laughs> Bruce Lee, yes. Now, many of you guys know him as a, probably one of the most um, influential mar martial artists of all time, but few of you know that he was actually a very brilliant philosopher as well, and he was really, really influential. In fact, uh, to be honest, um, his philosophies has actually taught me more about design than anything or anyone else. And he's inspired me so much that I've written my own book called The Tao of Design and User Experience. The main point that I want to share with you is that the best experience is no experience. But first of all, let me tell you a story. So I've been practicing design for a little while, um, but as I first started, I felt that as I practiced design that I was lacking some sort of ultimate philosophy, a way. While I understood design fairly well, I felt that something was missing. And I see this in other designers as well. I think that many, many, many designers don't know that they're missing something. The simple question I was trying to answer is, what is the best user experience? When you look, at, look this up, you, know, you get a bunch of answers that talk about enhancing or enriching, adding delight, uh, making things beautiful, visually appealing or elegant, and that things should be clean, clean and simple. Designers want to create the best user experience, but many lack complete definitions. And honestly, to me, if I were to look at all these definitions, um, to me they felt like they were lacking depth, because these, these were just a bunch of words thrown around. There's no substance to it, because ultimately, I mean, when you look at it, what does delightful mean, or what does elegant mean? because it can be quite subjective. So I searched, you know, I searched the web for the answer, but I couldn't find one that satisfied me. And since no answer could be found within the des design domain, I turned to philosophy. And I turned to Bruce Lee, specifically. Now, to be honest, his philosophy has nothing to do with design. But because I understood both design and martial arts, I was able to create an intersection between design and martial arts to draw a new form and a new way of thinking. Now, his philosophy um, is something that goes like this, using no way as a way, having no limitation as a limitation. To have no form is to assume all forms. So what does this mean? Well, in martial arts context, each form of fighting has its limitations. For example, when a person learns boxing, the person is only going to learn how to use their hands, not their feet. So boxing is a form of fighting that has its own limitation. Forms and styles are subject to limitation. Formlessness is to cling to no form so you can assume all forms. Therefore, its only limitation is to have no limitation. So this was a kind of a very liberating piece that I thought about for a very, very long time, and I tried to connect this to design. And I stared at it and just kept thinking, and you know, how can I take this philosophy and connect it to design? But finally, an idea came, and it's called using no interface as interface, no interaction as interaction, no experience as experience. Yet to have no experience is to have every experience. So you can kind of see the similarities here. Now, this is kind of abstract, so let me give you an example. Let's talk about the experience of driving. Now, all the way up to this point, the way that car manufacturers have thought about enhancing the driving experience was always along the, the lines of this. It's always about adding things like you know, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, um, power steering, Bluetooth, GPS. 
They want you to drive the vehicle, and they want you to feel good while doing it. But then you have Tesla who comes along, and you know, Tesla with their self-driving vehicle changes the whole game. Because as the user takes their hands off the wheel, the primary interface between the user and the vehicle is no longer there. This is called using no interface as interface. Now, where there's no interface, there's no interaction. Where there's no interaction, there's no experience. Instead, what the user experiences is driverless driving, experience without experience, to have driven without actually driving. The second part is to have no experience is to have every experience. So what does that mean? Well, instead of driving, you can be sleeping or eating pizza. <laughs> you see, the experience of driving won't actually be driving. It would actually be doing whatever you want to do. And because there's no limitation in this form of experience, it doesn't limit you from driving if you actually want to. Now, another example is shopping. So this is the traditional shopping experience. You'd walk into a store, pick up your items, line up, and sometimes the lineups can be long and frustrating. But that's OK, because sometimes you might get a pretty cashier who will then take your money. <laughs> but then you have Amazon Go. And what Amazon Go is, um, they're the world's most advanced shopping technology that uses computer vision, sensor fusion, and deep learning to detect when you take products from the shelf. And it also tracks them in a virtual cart. So what they've actually done is they've eliminated lines and checkouts. So you see, the shopping experience has completely transformed. And while sh some parts of it have been eliminated, the shopping experience is still there. But you see, they apply this philosophy, and they begin by eliminating the experience. The ultimate goal is to strive for no experience. It's important to understand that the highest form of user experience is to have no experience. It's important that this philosophy remains at the highest level so that you can constantly strive towards it. And if you can't achieve it, you can lower it down to something that's more attainable. So while Amazon Go doesn't completely eliminate the shopping experience, they've eliminated parts of it. So to sum it up, design and user experience has never been about adding more. It's about eliminating the inessentials like a sculptor who doesn't keep adding more clay, but instead chips away at the inessentials until the truth is revealed. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Do you have a project right now going on where you're speaking with? Um, it's always, it's all, I, so that philosophy is always, you know, as, as I practice it as design, I'm always, always using it. So whenever I try to create an experience, I'm always trying to reduce as much of it as possible. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in, in continuing the conversation, you can follow me on Twitter. If you're interested in learning more about the book, you can visit the site. It's DowDesignUX.com. Thank you. So yeah, we'll take another short break and we'll set up for the next the next talk.
Okay. Yeah. Okay, so last but not least, we have Anna. Okay, <laughs> okay hi everyone. Um, I'm here today to tell you about a project I worked on last summer. And um, I was playing around with some data, and you might ask me why data? That's because there is just, data is being more and more valued by um, a lot of industries now. A lot of data is being collected, and there are stats saying that in a few years' time, by 2020, we have like 44 trillion gigabytes of data collected. And um, with this amount of data, it's becoming more and more of a challenge for analysts and scientists to um, benefit and analyze this data the traditional way. So they actually need programmers now, like you and I, to collect, sort, and analyze the data in order to help them solve their problems. Um, so what kind of problems exist right now? So as I mentioned, they are like data is being valued across a lot of industries, and maybe something we're more familiar with would be like the consumer market. So um, there are a lot of consumer data that companies like Amazon, Google collect, and it helps them make better decisions. Um, better, uh, they know about trends, and they can make more uh, strategic decisions for their business planning. And then there's um, the health industry. There are a lot of challenges in, say, matching doctors with patients, um, s the scheduling system, or even like things like consolidating all the patient data across our country into one database. That still doesn't really exist right now. And um, a lot of other fields like science and research. Um, there are. Uh, there are challenges in mining the genome, the human genome. There's just so much data out there, and they uh, require a lot more programmers to work on that. So I mentioned, um, because it's a challenge, a lot of governments and organizations do open a lot of the data they have collected to the public. So there are open data sets online now um, that uh, just regular people like you and I can access. So if, say, you're interested in helping with um, solving problems in like uh, climate or housing, housing prices actually, housing prices, uh, geometrics, um, transit schedules, like you want to optimize transit or maybe make an app out of um, transit schedule data, you can go to like Open Canada or data.govbc.ca for all those um, data sets and if maybe you're interested in the scientific problems that exist right now um, say the genome analytics for cancer research uh, you could check out the cancer genome atlas um, that one's actually not public but if you're in the academia um, industry then you would have ac you might have access to it um, you could also check out uh, one called the uh, I think it's the Gene, uh, Gene Research Omnibus. It's, if you Google that, you'll probably be able to find it. It's also public open data sets. Um, for other things like Wikipedia page traffic, or if you're interested in like um, NASA data, there are a bunch of open data sets on the Amazon servers, the AWS Amazon.com. And then I come to um, also social media platforms. That's where we can find a lot of user data. Um, Facebook and Twitter collect a lot of user data from um, their big pool of users, and they have APIs for developers and programmers to access all this data. So um, let's go back to what the project I want to tell you guys about that we worked on last summer. Um, we used Twitter. Um, because it was Twitter being like a platform that's really popular and like p 
people around the world tweet about anything, about pretty much anything. Like if there's an event, an incident, there's always someone who wants to say something about it. Um, we thought Twitter would be a good source of information for um, analyzing or looking at human behavior or reflecting some kind of social human behavior towards a certain event. So um, when I was playing, we were playing with data, I wanted to, we want to look at, um, we want to find a big event where we'd be able to find enough users and enough tweets where we could see, like conclude or see some kind of result from the amount of tweets that might happen because of this event. And that event turned out to be the Euro Cup. So last year when we were working on this, the Euro Cup was happening. And in case you guys aren't familiar or you aren't soccer fans, the FIFA Euro Cup happens only every four years. And soccer being a major sport and a well-loved sport around the world, um, it's a really big event. And um, we, we were questioning and wondering if um, we could use Twitter to predict what happened throughout the Euro Cup. So um, when we were working on our project, we want to look at the results for the finals game. So the finals game was Portugal against France. Um, we want to see how um, the tweets could reflect what actually happened in the game. If we can just look at all the tweets about the game and then know uh, the results, maybe the goal results or who won, you know, all these kind of questions we had in mind. Um, so how did we approach this? There was, um, there is something called Tweepy, which is a Python library you can use um, to access the Twitter API. Uh, Tweepy is, provides like a script. So if you first um, register as a Twitter developer, you'll get like access to their API using like, a, they'll give you a token, they'll give you an access code, and then you can use something like Tweepy uh, where you can run the script and it'll search for the tweets that you want and collect all those tweets into like, like a, a list form, like a text file. So for our case, we put in, you can put in keywords that you want to search for in the tweets so for us, it was like Portugal and France. We want to look for all tweets that had these words in it. Um, we included keywords like the shortened form of Portugal, like P-O-R or like France, F-R-A, so that we couldn't include anything about those um, countries in the tweets during that time that we ran the script. So um, during the finals, um, we ran the script a day and a half before the finals. Um, and we ran that on uh, Amazon. Instead of running that script on our computers, we had to run it on a web server, something like Amazon Web Server, so that we won't be um, affected by any type of disconnection of the internet or hardware failures. And because of the amount of data we'd be collecting, we had to host it on the server. So on, while we were waiting for the script, to complete, well, more like we just waited like a day before we ran the script and then the actual game started. So we had to, we just let the script run. Um, we ourselves did watch the game, by the way. It's not like we skipped the game just for testing this experiment, <laughs> this project. But um, by the end of the game, um, we ended up with 30 gigs of tweets, just like text data. So 30 gigs of text data on our Amazon servers, and we were supposed to do something with it. <laughs> so one thing we did was we wrote, uh, in Python, we used, um, we wrote some scripts to parse through it, and we looked for um, sentimental uh, data. So through, so there's something called sentiment, sentiment anal analysis, online uh, from the Cambridge University. They have like a list of positive words that you can use to analyze text to, and to find out whether it reflects like a positive, ex um, a positive emotion from what they wrote. And then same with negative words. Um, and then we would, uh, what we did was parse through all our tweets, um, conclude whether each tweet was a positive, uh, neutral or a negative emotion and then 
by associating whether the tweet was uh, talking about Portugal or about France, we were able to tally like a time series graph, um, a time series graph, time series graph for the positive, negative, and um, neutral stats for both countries. So that's what 30 gigs looked like. <laughs> Um, and if we zoom in to just on the day of the finals game, this was on the days of the final, finals game. And the finals game was actually right in the middle. So it ran the two hours, um, I can highlight it. This was the, these were the amount of tweets that were tweeted about each country during the game. So um, we can see how um, the number of tweets about Portugal was much higher. So the blue and the yellow were both about Portugal, Portugal neutral and um, Portugal overall. And then there were amount, uh, there were significantly less tweets about France during like somehow in the middle of the game. So if we looked further at those points, the, the highest point of the graph, um, where there were the most tweets, most amount of tweets during this whole time. Um, we parsed through all the tweets at that moment, at that, I think it was that few seconds, um, and looked for the top 10 words. Um, we can see that like in the top four already, you see that Portugal was in most of the tweets. And um, there was like a goal, like it looked like a goal happened maybe, like, cause that was like the sixth top word and then also the fifth top word was like one to zero. <laughs> so that might look like the, the score at that moment. So if you cross check that with like news articles, that was when Portugal scored and won the Euro Cup yes, that year at that moment. And that was our little fun project, just testing out Twitter and seeing how sentiment analysis could show us something. Uh, some things we learned from doing this project. Um, well, I've, I've presented this talk before at Code and & Coffee and one of the users, uh, one of the audience did mention um, if you get large amounts of data, like we, we had 30 gigs of data, but say if you want to work on a project with even bigger amounts of data, you can use um, something like Hadoop to process the data. Um, we were just using one single computer to process it but um, Hadoop would be something to go to if you have more data. And then also, um, we were analyzing the sentiments just in English, and since, like say the Euro Cup, for, uh, like to enhance this project, you would want to analyze it in different languages, not just English. Uh, some resources, if you wanna do something similar, um, you can check out the Twitter API guide and then the sentiment analysis from the Cambridge University. Uh, it's called an opinion lexicon. I can share these slides later if you want the links. Um, and if my presentation interested you, like if you like data competitions or working with data sets, um, there are, you should definitely check out Kaggle.com. That's where you get a lot of tutorials and find a lot of competitions that you can participate in. And then there's also a local organization called opendatabc.ca. I've actually participated in one of their hackathons this year and they do run a bunch of hackathons throughout the year. They work with different organizations um, and it's a great way for you to tackle some problems that we do have exist locally and then to contribute to your community. So um, I'll just end off with you know, let's all build some data tools to benefit the world. And I know you're all out there, lots of programmers. <laughs> yeah, so thank you and. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, our project results are on just developing stuff.github.io. Um, and if you have any questions or you wanna contact me, here's my email and I Instagram a lot, so you can find me on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Hi. Um, what did you do to use to filter and parse the data? 
of to filter and parse, we wrote our own Python script. Yeah. That was actually R and ggplot, yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>